Welcome to another video where we're going to be discussing lateral pelvic tilt and the leg length discrepancy. Um, I did a quick video earlier a few weeks ago about this and this is a bit of an e expansion upon that video so I'm going to try and get through this as quick as I can because there's a, tack, a stack of information. So, so firstly with the pelvic tilt um, there is obviously a, a lot of compensation that's a result of whenever the pelvis is not maintained in its square and level position. Um, and basically the body is going to shift things out on the supporting leg out to the side. It could go either laterally this way or it could actually go laterally the other way where the leg actually stiffens up and they and they have like a reverse Trendelenburg. But basically what the body is forced to do is to try and uh, manipulate everything to get the eyes level. So it's always wanting to get uh, um, the eyes level and it will do anything, it will sacrifice anything in order to do so. So this is where you be, people are told that they've got a leg longer than the other when in most cases it's actually like a muscular imbalance from repeated poor movements and just uh, you know a, a something that's evolved over time. The actual bone lengths themselves are quite the same, it's just the way that they're positioned is not. So the chain reaction of this um, poor position, the immediate problem is always felt at the hips or the spine, but and, and you can actually see it quite easily in walking and running, but um, the, the, this poor uh, position places a lot of pressure into other areas, um, also being the shoulders, where the, which we'll go into shortly in a second, where we see a lot of depressed shoulders and um, resulting in impingements and rotator cuff tears and all sorts of stuff. But, the failure to correct the condition eventually just leads to a lifetime of chronic pain and that starts to really impact upon all the daily activities. So so now breaking down this into two types of leg length and I quickly touched on it a minute ago that some, a lot of people are told that they've got a leg longer and there are definitely some people that are but the, it's almost like everyone's told that when there's when they're actually probably on the other side. So the two types of leg length discrepancies you need to understand are there's an anatomical one which is uh, the quite rare one and the functional one which is the more common one. So the anatomical one is um, is where someone really does have a length, bone length difference and, and it does happen from time to time. Um, the American Academy of Orthopaedic Surgeons uh, they, they pretty much state like it's about four centimetre difference in the bone length that, that they would, uh, I suppose you could say, classify as an anatomical leg length. If it's less than that, it, it may not have an impact on the pelvic alignment as such. Um, and, and anything that's four centimetres more, you will start to see walking, walking difficulties and limping, for example. So in these cases, the anatomical one, um, this could be something that, that evolved from a birth defect or, um, or not, not growing uh, the development of the child um, for various reasons. Could have been a bone infection or, or a severe break early on or it could be just poor nutrition even. Um, could even ju juvenile arthritis, all those sort of things. Could be a lot of sort of reasons for that formation of the bone being different length but um, in terms of exercise intervention, very limited in these cases as it's really a structural problem um, and not a muscular imbalance as such. The functional type, however, is the one where you can change things. All right, So this is a leg length problem that, that was formed from poor repetitive movements, meaning that you can correct it if you have the, um, the, the, the right plan in place and strategy to address the, the root cause and and begin changing the motor patterns that are uh, corrupted. So the uneven hips just ruin everything and this picture gives a good example of where the foot collapses, the knee rot rolls in, the pelvis tilts, scoliosis forms and the right shoulder actually drops. So it's, a lot of people think it's this shoulder but it's actually this one um, that, that really drops and gets really depressed because it's trying to pull itself down in order to get the eyes straight. See, So um, that's a nice posture where everything's aligned really well nothing goes wrong here but everything goes wrong there and it could be anything from Achilles problems to plantar fasciitis in the foot to um, repeated calf strains obviously a stack of knee injuries is going to happen and with this case um, not to mention all the hip problems and definitely spinal problems and lastly shoulder problems so you could have all of the above 
all happening from this sort of one thing or it could be just one case it could be just in certain spots but eventually they're all going to be worn out all right so the most common immediate sense of pain is usually felt in the hips and the spine so we see SIJ problems, piriformis syndrome, all types of other hip areas. Um, stiffness obviously is going to definitely impact as the body tries to uh, correct the hip dysfunction, which obviously is going to have a huge problem on how you bend and how you move, leading to bulging discs and all sorts of things. So as are the result of the uneven hips we sometimes see in these areas. So the poor hip mobility, like we mentioned, so not moving very well with bending. This for basically the hips stop becoming mobile so then the lumbar spine is forced to flex to make up for the lost mobility and then the bulging disc is inevitable. Um, also lost gluteal strength which is a huge factor in this being uh, developed in the very first place so which we'll touch on again in, in, in a minute but um, basically the more strength they lose the greater the pelvic tilt and the worsening of the condition it just evolves into. Uh, so the uneven shoulders we spoke about before, so this is where we see a depressed shoulder. So this is a picture of, an, of a depressed shoulder. Obviously we wouldn't see on both sides, we would just see one side. This would be someone who has good muscle definition in the upper traps, this person has none. Um, this person is going to have all sorts of problems through the shoulder here. Um, overhead things going to be, uh, chronic neck pain is also going to be an end result of this. Um, you know, and it's going to be heavily tied into the pelvic dysfunction. All right, so. Uh, scapular winging is another thing we will also see, so it's with the shoulder blade sticking out at the back. Um, again, going to create huge problems for the shoulder in there because there's the stability of these joints greatly compromised. The weakness within the serratus anterior and the lower trapezius will just keep things running and you know chronic trigger points. Very difficult to gain strength in pushing patterns, overhead movements. Uneven hips just will also will impact on the rib cage, so you'll see one side sort of twisted and the other, the other side. So the ribs on the side with a higher hip basically stick out further than the other side. Um, this will then alter breathing mechanics, which then greatly influence stability of the entire body and posture and everything. So forward head posture um, will develop as a result of altered breathing mechanics. Scoliosis, that's, a, uh, that's one of the obvious things you begin to see, so it's where you start to see a curvature like a like a um, shape of an S or a C. Um, in some cases the scoliosis may have started first creating the lateral pelvic tilt, but in most cases it's the lateral, lateral pelvic tilt that came first. Um, and in, and in, in, but whenever we see that, there's the, the reports here state that 87% of people with leg length differences also have scoliosis. It's sort of an inevitable part of the body being uh, twisting the spine in order to get the eyes level. All right, so it's a reaction to trying to get the eyes level. Otherwise, you're sort of walking, falling, up, falling over. I would say. Um, so, so the anatomical one, as we spoke about, much more difficult to change, and we can't really go into that because it's just much more complex topic and nothing that we can really do from a very easy exercise intervention as such, but there's all different types of scoliosis where it may form. So it could be like a thoracic one, it could be a lumbar one, it could be a thoracolumbar, or it could be a combined one. So there's many different types of scoliosis. Um, none of them are really great to have. They all create all types of problems. This one here is probably the one that you, you would often associate with the lateral pelvic tilt. And you can you can actually see this pelvic tilt really t tilting here, as same with this one. All right, so um, many different versions of scoliosis. Um, at the end of the day, they're all far from ideal. So what what do you do to find the cause of it all? Because before you even try to begin a corrective program, you must try to f identify what started it all off. Where what what are the repetitive movements that you did to to actually um, make your body attempt to, to correct it with this scoliosis type thing happening. So where do you look for? Well, poor posture, so look for the repeated, repetitive habits of how you sit in chairs, um, how you stand, a lot of people love to stand on one leg, um, cross their legs, it's another bad thing you see. Um, so the, all these sort of repeated things that you don't have any immediate pain from and you don't see any problem with the way that you're doing it. Even sports, which we'll touch on in a second, they can be a, a real factor in this and you see that quite a lot in fast bowlers in cricket, um, even tennis players to some degree. Um, and it's where 
you, a corrective program is absolutely essential to prevent the on the uh, development of these problems. But basically, just look for anything that's a repetitive task and so, something that you do a lot as a, as a habit. Um, things like sleeping as well. That's another another area that you could really trace back to. You know, like if your pillow's too high, or the mattress isn't right, or you love to cross one leg over, it doesn't sit on the top. It can really twist the spine. Again, you don't get an immediate pain from it, but it, it starts to become a big problem once you're doing it all the time. So um, if you're staying in the one position with one hip higher than the other, it's inevitable. So try to identify these these um, movements that you make. Um, this, you know, again, a lot of this will have to do with the glutes, and I'll touch again on this later, um, how, how it all sort of ties in with each other. But the unilateral sports, which I touched on a minute ago, these are where things like the tennis, the fast bowler and cricket, where the repeated motion forces one side of the body to become stronger than the other and easily creates a multitude of the, for the problems for the pelvis. As one's sort of being overly stretched and one's being overly crushed and stronger. And um, if you don't have a corrective program to balance you out, uh, there's a real good high chance that you're going to develop these issues. So um, handedness. So handedness... Um, refers to what's your dominant side. Now, most people in society are right-handed and many of the daily activities and postural positions predispose people to problems of muscular imbalances. One side of the body is repeatedly used more than the other. Um, this tends to happen less with left-handed left people because they're constantly being having to conform to right-handed positions and activities. So usually you don't see this lateral tilt as much in left-handers as you do in right-handers, which is quite an interesting fact. I don't have statistics on it, but it's it's quite an interesting phenomenon. So, um, so if you're left-handed, you've got a good chance of, of avoiding this sort of problem. So, but try to look for these repeated things you're always doing. Your right hand could be an occupation, could be a hobby. Your musical instruments is another um, repeated one where we may see this happen. All right. So, um, again, you. You don't have to give up your instrument or your sport. You just need a program that actually uh, counters the, the damage your sport's creating for you. Um, foot instability, and this is a huge one. Um, and this is where we've done many articles and videos on this before. But if the foot fails to do the two critical things, which is absorb shock and then stabilize and push off the ground when we walk, run, or jump, the pelvis is going to be thrown out just because the, the foot just rolled you in. Remember the picture of early on where we, we showed you how the um, what happens once that, that sort of set it all off. So if the foot collapses from excessive pronation, you're guaranteed to have trouble. And this is often where people are pre um, prescribed orthotics to counter this, which is, I'll touch on in a minute, which gives us sort of a short-term fix, but really doesn't address the problem of the foot not acting like a spring to be soft and flexible enough to be like a shock absorber for the body and then be stiff enough to provide the power to move you forward when you're walking. So this is why we often see this problem exacerbated from walking and even more so in running. So so if you if you lose any of your problems of being able to lock the foot at one point and then being un able to unlock it at the next part of the movement, you're going to have huge trouble and it's inevitable it's going to head up the chain. All right, so what does that excessive pronation might look like? Well, it's this middle picture here where you would see a um, that it's not so often you don't see this hollow high arch. The normal one, obviously, there's quite a few people that are there, but this one's probably the more common one, especially in terms of lateral tilting. So, um, so it's really easy to see it when you're in barefoot or you're standing, like you get out of the shower and you can see a full footprint. You shouldn't see that. Your footprint should look more like that. All right. Um, so, the when the foot becomes weak, the glutes become weak because this pelvic tilting starts to really impact on how it's working. Remember we spoke about the hip mobility before. So then um, it makes it virtually impossible for it to be create, for the um, to become a rigid lever to create the spring. So now the inability of the glutes to fire now becomes a massive problem in the single leg stance. Because in the single leg stance, the glute medius in particular is really a huge um, part of stabilizing the and lining the femur so that you don't roll inwards like walking with knock knees but if it never has a chance to get in the position in the first place due to the feet then you're in you're inevitably going to have a huge problem and in the gait cycle that's massive because you need that that uh, while that leg's swinging in the air the stance leg has to do all those things but 
um, it'll have no chance of doing that. And this is an example of what you would see in a running pattern where that where that there's that clap collapsing, and you can see here that spine really bending into a scoliosis as the the pelvis is sort of um, being all put into a lot of problems. So um, this person will often feel like when they walk, the shorter leg will feel like it's almost stepping down from a step, almost like like it's stepping in a pothole. Um, and the, the other leg sort of goes into like a pole vaulting type action where, where it sort of stiffens uh, to propel you forward and basically you're rocking side to side. Um, once you've done thousands or even millions of these poor repetitions, it basically gets encoded into the spinal cord really, not so much into the brain, but into the nervous system itself as the preferred way to walk. The brain doesn't question if it's good or bad, it just, it just uses whatever it knows the most. So. You can see how compensatory programs can be really difficult to get rid of um, and you need a lot of, and also why you will not get rid of it if you just use isolated exercises or uh, a stretch or one sort of strengthening exercise. You, have to have, you will have to actually change the walking pattern itself um, to be able to make an effect and I'll show you how to do that at the end. Um, so, so this is a quick e explanation of what happens. Um, when, when all of this goes wrong. So as the pelvis sways sideways, the, uh, the pelvis is higher on the right side. The right side is then ad adducted, which uh, we use adductors are like groin muscles. The left, lip, left hip joint is then abducted. The right abductors are stretched and weakened. The left abductors and TFL are held in a shortened position. Um, all of these are just the various things that are going wrong just around the hip. This is not even looking at all of the foot and knee problems that are happening as well because I basically just ran out of room on the page to include them all. But I just sort of looked at, okay, these are the various problems that are happening with all the muscles around the hip here. Now, there's, some are being really overly stretched, some are being overly shortened, and they've just been repeatedly kept in that position, which then keeps this horrible spinal alignment and, and leg alignment. All right, so what, what are the best exercises to correct it? Well, there's no one thing, um, and everyone's a little bit different as to what they may need the most. But um, in this case, like many other injuries, it's a bit of a paradox because the, the very movement that's likely to fix you the most is also the very same one that's likely to aggravate things. So in this case, it's the single leg stance. So, so you basically want to have a program that teaches you how to control the single leg stance. But to just go straight to that would not be wise. All you will do is create trouble. You've got to have a, like a plan of sort of getting there slowly. So always remember this quote, the best place for the lumbar spine to function, be safe from damage is when it remains in neutral. So you're trying to sort of do that from the very beginning. Um, so starting with very simple things like hip mobility and breathing mechanics in, in floor-based movements where you can really gain a lot of control. Um, it's not going to be anywhere near enough to change things on their own, but they're a stepping stone to the things that are. Make sure you check the description on the video here because I have links to all the videos that are, these are screenshots of some of the videos of, that we've done before on this because um, that'll go into detail of how to do that because I just, if I try to do it now, this video will go for two hours. Um, working on foot stability, <coughs> as I said before, I advise against using orthotics. Um, it can be a shortcut to a problem, but then it might create a stack of other problems before. I know this myself because it happened to me. So, um, so the problem is that it just assumes that your body is able to generate the correct firing mechanisms and movement function of the muscles immediately, which is highly unlikely. Um, you would be much more wiser to have worked on your foot stability, use things like toe spreaders, sensor mat, not necessarily in this single leg stuff, but bilateral movements, basic foot drills, toe drills, big toe functions, a big one, so we see um, bunions and all that sort of forming from poor stability. Um, and that would lead into other things and would help you to really degenerate the strength in your feet. Uh, one exercise I love to use early on is this hip extension test, and it's a really simple one, and you can really easily see the, the poor stability um, and the compensation, um, but without the, the potential for aggravating things. So. It really teaches that person how to get good control through the obliques and the um, and the glutes on the op on the opposing sides to create that perfect symmetrical uh, 
uh, pelvic alignment. Um, again, check the description on the video because I'll put the link for this video there so you can see how that's done. But this is a great one in the beginning, along with the breathing stuff, the hip mobility and the foot stability stuff. If you're already out there, you're already a big way to correcting things, but like I said before, you, you, until you actually put it all into the walking pattern itself, you won't fix it long term. But by this stage, you already should be reducing some of the symptoms. Um, make sure on the glute um, exercise that you don't over squeeze them. If you sort of squeeze them as you're seeing here, you're going to create other problems, especially in the hip socket there, so where we see hip impingements and stuff like that. So just make sure you stay in uh, neutral alignment, right? So don't ever force things and, and try to think that harder and tighter is better because it's not. Um, the horse stance, which we sort of quickly showed before on the early one with the breathing, this is a great one. I love to use this one because the person can really get a good feel of that neutral alignment and I can basically putting you in this unstable position. You can begin to learn how to the glute and the, and the abdominals working well on opposing side, just like that hip extension test but in a prone position instead of a supine one. Um, and also generating hip extension more like the leg swing as you would see in the walking phase as opposed to pushing up and down like the hip extension. This more has a correlation to walking than the hip extension does. Alright, so uh, and also if I add resistance to this, the glute max, I really can target it quite well in this one than I can in nearly any other one um, where, the, where we might see glute medius get more involved. Um, this exercise is a bit of a strange one, the hip hike. Again, I'll put the link in the description here for you so you can check that out. Uh, this is a great way to transition from the floor to standing. It's very difficult to just go straight to standing, especially with single leg stuff. So I will use this one from time to time and basically it puts the person in the hip hike position that's awful and then they learn how to correct it by putting their hand on their butt and contracting the, the glute medius to level off the pelvis. Again, it's nowhere near enough to be to change things, but it gives them that feeling of how do they, how do they generate it in the single leg stance where balance is not an issue and they, they're starting to get to that point where, okay, we're getting closer to the end game. The deadlift in the bilateral stance, especially the Romanian deadlift, is a great one because it teaches you how to really generate um, good hip mobility, glute control, um, pelvic alignment, spinal alignment, bracing. It basically does a lot of great stuff for you in this bilateral stance. really sets the, the foundations for getting to the single leg with good control. And you can build a lot of strength and reserve. Again, nowhere near enough to control the lateral thing because the foot stability is not a factor in this one. When you move to the single leg one, it's a massive factor, but this is a great one to do before you get to that. Um, uh, with the single leg st stance, once I've moved from the Romanian deadlift, I will start to try and get into the single leg stance like toe touch drills, um, and then the single leg deadlift and even then the step step up, which is a very difficult one. This one's a real issue for the lateral pelvic tilt. Really find it difficult to control this. So I'll sort of start with this really basic one, building my way up to much more difficult ones as I go each time the glutes and then various things like the uh, posterior sling and lateral sling become heavily involved in these. So in the uh, single leg stance, you can see here a picture of me. This is a real, where you'll see a beautiful alignment through foot, knee, and hip. And I'm working in multi-directions with this toe touch drill. So I can really look for poor, poor, poor leg alignment, poor postural alignment, poor range of motion, but with very little risk of injury or aggravating things because I'm not going into excessive range. I'm not adding load or speed. All right, so a great one to begin with. It's a toe touch drill. Um, once I've sort of got some of that moving, and then I and started to add load with single leg deadlifts, so I can move into these more complex things where I'm integrating upper body and combining with the posterior sling, um, you know, and really starting to get activate a, a ton of stuff in the single leg stance, way more than the the bilateral stances. The the foot stability is a huge factor in this. The last one that I would work on is this suitcase carry. Which, are, which is like the farmer's walk, but only with one, uh, one kettlebell, one dumbbell or a barbell. Um, and this is a very great way to actually correct this problem um, because the QL on, on the opposite side has to really work with the glutes and the obliques or else the barbell or dumbbell, whatever you're holding, will swing around on you. You really get to see the exercise correct the problem for you. Um, it just can be very difficult if you haven't done all the prior steps. 
but this is where you're actually changing the walking pattern itself and learning to stiffen that hip and really get the strength into the glutes but not through all of the um, compensatory methods that the body has devised itself. Um, so then you get to, then you can move into the more powerful step ups and all these and stair climbs and and that's where you start to see lateral sling um, and again seeing where the sling connects the glute medius and minimus to the stance leg with the ductors and the QL. So a great great exercise would be one of my favourites for this uh, for these people with lateral tilt. But again, I could go straight to it and I would get nowhere if because they just don't have foot stability or hip hip mobility or enough strength perhaps in the glutes and simple stuff, they'll never get this. So I can't go straight to it, I have to build up to it. Um, so in summary, the very as you can see it's a quite a complex dysfunction to correct. There's no rule book that's 100% certain on how to do all of these. Just a stack of possibilities and for you to explore and rule out. So if you can treat the, you can use the exercise shown in this uh, video, narrow down your exercise selection to the drills you need the most. Some people might need more of the basic foot stability, others might be hip mobility and, and going straight to the complex patterns. Um, and remember, you always must find the repetitive habit first. If you don't do that at the beginning, it's pointless trying to do this corrective work because the very thing that started it is still doing it. So it's never going to change. All right. So if you need more help or you have questions, there's heaps of programs on the website. Remember, check under the description here because I've left heaps of links to things that have a lot more information that can expand upon what I'm just really just skimming over very quickly. All right. So. Um, I hope you've enjoyed that video and we'll see you on our next one.